Okay, well, hello everybody and welcome to the Citizens for Global Solutions Virtual Book Club. Today is February 12th, 2022. Um, I'm Bob Flax, the Executive Director, and I'm joined by Gail Hughes, our Book Club Coordinator, who continues to do, and even a moment ago, has continued her wonderful job of keeping us all informed of the readings and sending out the PDFs and everything else she does behind the scenes to coordinate. So today is our second session, um, Reading the Politics of World Federation by Joseph Barada. And we're pleased to once again have Joseph join us. Uh, we'll be focusing on chapters four and six today. Uh, we'll proceed as usual. Uh, in a moment, I'll turn the floor over to Joseph who will uh, be able to point out any highlights or main takeaways or whatever he would like to present about these two chapters. And then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. Um, I ask everybody at this time to go on mute uh, during the portion of Joseph's presentation. So we uh, eliminate the phones ringing and the children crying and the dogs barking uh, in the background. So if you would please do that. And um, there is, but most of you are probably familiar with the, the chat box uh, that we have. Uh, you're welcome to communicate amongst yourselves with that, but we don't uh, formally manage or, uh, or monitor the chat. However, if there is some type of emergency that you, you don't hear the sound or whatever, uh, please feel free to put that in and whoever does see that alert us and we can stop and see if there's something that we could fix on our side. Um, we will stop about 10 minutes before the end of the session. Uh, to allow anyone uh, who has any announcements that are relevant to our work uh, to make at that time or promote any books, movies, events, anything they're doing. So if you have something that you'd like to announce, we ask you to please hold that to the end uh, rather than do that in the middle of the session. And uh, lastly, that if somebody comes on uh, to, the, uh, to the Zoom call that we, we, we don't uh, know their name, we're not familiar with them, uh, we will stop and take a moment just to check in with them um, to prevent what they call Zoom bombing. Um, we've been lucky we haven't had that in the book club, but we have had that on, I think, just one, of, one meeting uh, where people come in and hack in and ruin the whole, uh, the, the, the whole, the whole Zoom call. If that were to happen, uh, we just ask everybody to hang up, to leave the call, wait five minutes, and come back in again. So that's how we'll handle that. So without any further ado, I'd like to uh, turn this over to Joseph Barada. Uh, Joseph, the floor is yours. Well, greetings, everybody. I'm glad to see you back. I have reviewed the Zoom recording from last month's meeting. As usual, in a few days or a week, I think of the perfect response. If you would like to repeat your question um, or uh, improve it, why? Uh, and ask a new one why, please feel free to write to me by email. My email address is Joseph Barada, one word, uh, at Mac, M A C dot com. Um, I will have time to check my facts and uh, perhaps fetch a book, and then I will write back to you. I urge you to uh, share my answers with others. It's actually better to do this in writing. Um, as Francis Bacon says, reading maketh a full man, conference a ready man, and writing an exact man. <laughs> and now I'd like to go back to the introduction and draw your attention to a couple of things. First, major problems in constructing world federation. There are four of them. Membership, representation, powers and transition. You'll find this on pages 12 to 17 of the introduction. Uh, these uh, ter these uh, problems uh, produce uh, very specific terms like mi minimalism and maximalism. And I'd like everybody to understand them. And we, <clears throat> now on membership, after the second world war, there was a debate whether the, uh, a desired world federal government ought to be universal in membership or limited to the democracies. Uh, Clarence Streit was uh, an eloquent uh, proponent of a union, uh, union of the democracies, originally uh, to counter Nazi Germany. Uh, they had a preponderance of force and uh, actually on paper, while the armed forces of France and Britain and the other democracies 
the United States is two in Canada, why uh, they uh, over, would overwhelm Nazi Germany uh, and thus prevent the war. So Streit was uh, quite uh, firm about uh, starting with the democracies. But the uh, leaders of the uh, mainstream uh, World Federalists uh, had gotten beyond uh, the, uh, an anti-German uh, democratic alliance and they argued that no, we should seek to bring in all countries, no matter what form of government they had, uh, including uh, the, the communist party states, also socialist party states, and uh, for that matter, even a few monarchies. Um, so United World Federalists uh, were universalists. Um, and this led to some very um, sanguine, uh, expectations that it would be possible to form a, a legislature drawn from all the principal nation states of the world, um, even if they were uh, governed by monolithic communist parties. So there was um, universalism in membership and membership limited to the democracies. Then on representation, um, the um, pure democratic principle is one person, one vote. And this would uh, mean that populous countries like India and China um, would have an overwhelming majority in the world legislature. And so um, there were various schemes of weighted representation produced uh, in an attempt to make a uh, a, uh, a universal world federal legislature um, acceptable to the great powers. Um, and uh, Clark, uh, Grenville Clark had a system of um, stepwise representation whereby the largest countries, the United States, Russia, India, and China would each have 30 represent representatives and so on down the line uh, to the smallest states. Um, you may know that um, uh, that uh, 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 Joseph, um, oh, I was forgetting his name now, but um, has proposed something based upon the square root of population, which would, would reduce the number of representatives uh, equally. Yeah, Sh Joseph Schwartzberg. Schwartzberg, yes. Uh, and there, uh, there, there are similar uh, schemes. Uh, the, uh, the German group of uh, Dem Democracies Beyond Borders uh, has a, um, its own scheme of weighted representation. So uh, weighted representation is actually uh, something that is familiar at the United Nations. The World Bank and the IMF um, make decisions on the majority, although the uh, the states have more votes uh, depending on their capital contributions than the, the smaller states. But again, it's a violation of the pure democratic principle um, of one person, one vote. It's a little better than the UN's principle of one state, one vote. Um, but anyway, this is a vexed problem and there's never been a um, solution short of waiting until the all the countries on earth become more equitable and we can have a pure democratic system of uh, proportional representation. Uh, then there's a problem of powers. <clears throat> there are two views on this, the minimalists and the maximalists. Um, uh, the Chicago committee led by uh, Robert Hutchins and uh, G.A. Borgesa um, they argued that the purpose, the purpose of, uh, of a federal government of the world was to achieve both peace and justice. The uh, mainstream American groups, including Clark and the United World Federalists under uh, Cord Meyer, um, argued that this was impractical, that uh, we couldn't uh, give maximal powers at the first step 
we had to be satisfied just with the purpose of, of peace. Um, so um, the mainstream group uh, uh, limited the powers recommended to those that would um, establish the international control of atomic energy uh, and uh, the control of conventional arms and general disarmament. Um, whereas the Chicago committee argued that the crisis of civilization in 1945 was to achieve justice, which often, which meant um, uh, uh, the dissolution of the colonial empires. It meant the uh, adjustment of racial uh, laws, including segregation laws in the United States. Um, and uh, it meant to uh, full implementation of uh, the new uh, standards of human rights. So, um, Uh, the uh, mainstream, you see, was very cautious uh, that most uh, Clark thought that in future amendment, as, this, as, the, as the limited world government became uh, safe, proven safe, uh, why then amendment could enlarge the powers of um, the government. And fourthly, there's the problem of the transition, one of the equally difficult of all problems. <clears throat> there are two alternatives, the official meth the official uh, transition and the unofficial. Um, the official uh, me method of achieving world government was laid out as one to influence pu public opinion uh, and hence um, motivate the national government of the United States or of Great Britain or France or Russia uh, to um, undertake the diplomacy uh, necessary to establish a government of the world, just like it had done to establish the United Nations. And there were other people um, who argued that the national states are the great enemies of this process and we'll, we never could enlist the national governments in a, a process of establishing a common government, uh, we would have to undertake a more revolutionary course. Um, and um, Gary Davis was a, an example of uh, someone like this. And also the uh, member of parliament, Henry Usborne, uh, who organized a camp, an international campaign to convene a world constitutional uh, convention. Kind of like what actually was done in the United States to form the, United, the US government. We would have to appeal to the people regarded as sovereigns and assemble delegates to a constitutional uh, convention uh, uh, drafting convention to draft the, the, char the constitution of a first world government. Um, and Osborne's project, I should tell you, I, 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 it's in a later chapter, uh, but, and it's not one I'm distributing. Um, uh, Osborne's project actually led to the convening of uh, a um, first world People's Constitutional Convention. He chose uh, Geneva and a few years um, in advance, he figured 1950 would be a good year. And as it happened, uh, the convention convened in December of 1950 after the start of the Korean War. And the war was generally considered by virtually everybody, including Federalists, as uh, ending the hopes of, a, of a, a peaceful establishment of world government. And the revolutionary approach um, was a fiasco. There were only three elected persons uh, 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 there and um, about 500 uh, sympathizers and um, it all broke up. Um, 
However, today there are certain groups, um, especially at San Francisco, uh, Roger Cotilla and um, uh, the third, the second person I've his name is slipping my mind. Uh, you're probably thinking of Glenn Martin and the Glenn World Martin. Constitution and Parliament yeah. Association. Yeah. These people remain uh, rather true to this um, revolutionary approach. Uh, they use a constitution first drafted by Philip Isley, uh, once a member of the radical student group called World Republic. Um, and if you want to look at a typical uh, draft constitution, you might look at the Constitution for the Federation of Earth. Um, there are others like the Chicago Constitution and uh, Grenville Clark and Louis Bisson's book, World Peace Through World Law. Um, yeah. Joseph, let me just cut in to let you know that Glenn Martin was one of our authors. We went through his book and the entire series of sessions is on our website with him. So people have had a copy of, the cons of their constitution. All right. Well, yeah. there's nothing that can more fully um, inform you about what the ideal is than to read one of these draft constitutions. And you can see um, what would be required uh, to establish real peace um, or peace and justice. All right, I'm gonna move on now. Uh, second, still on the introduction, it's, it must be understood that world federalists aim to change public opinion as the first step to changing the laws. They agreed with Abraham Lincoln, quote, public sentiment is everything. With public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without public sentiment, nothing can succeed. Hence, he who molds public sentiment goes deeper than he who enacts statutes or pronounces decisions. He makes statutes or decisions possible or impossible to be executed. Hence, United World Federalists pursued all the means of influencing public opinion in favor of American participation in a reformed United Nations or new world federal government. Club meetings, pamphlets, letters to the editor, magazine articles, radio programs, books, student debates, conferences, billboards, political cartoons, films, and even a Broadway play, and most vital fundraising. Money really uh, is the key to success here. So finally would come lobbying of representatives and senators in order to uh, gain official uh, initiatives toward uh, actually establishing a successor to the United Nations. Thirdly, I'd like you to notice at the very end of the introduction, pages 25 to 26, the list of contemporary ex expressions for the older historically loaded world federalist terms. I would recommend you take a look at those two, two pages uh, because if you read widely in uh, uh, United Nations documents or uh, the works of the global governance uh, by um, um, uh, uh, um, by Thomas G. Weiss, uh, works that you will have to uh, become, you have to read while you'll find these new terms and you'll wonder what in the world is the link between the older ideals of world federation. So I'll give you a few examples of equivalent terms. Subsidiarity means federalism. Um, it means the uh, formation of of higher authorities, but no higher than less, lesser ones are, are su sufficient. Uh, secondly, competence basically means a sovereignty. Um, consensus is majority rule. Norms from the Latin norma is equivalent to laws. 
common action means binding law. Legitimacy means lawfulness, consent of the governed. Human rights means justice. And lastly, central governance is an equivalent term to world government. Okay. Now to turn to chapter four, US State Department planning for the United Nations. Most readers with a sense of history find this chapter very impressive, especially with its notes. They cannot believe that the United States ever seriously considered planning for a world federation. The Harley Nodder papers in the National Archives provide a record of such thinking. There were two choices between before the Advisory Committee on Post-War Foreign Policy, the cooperative form or the federal form. That is an international organization based on voluntary cooperation established by treaty or a federal government of the world based on the rule of law established by a democratic world constitution. This choice was alive from the formation of the committee just after Pearl Harbor on 28 December 1941 to the Moscow conference in the midst of the Second World War, concluding on 11 November 1943. At that time, the United States, Soviet Union, Britain and China agreed only to the establishment of an international organization based on the sovereign equality of states. That implied the unanimity of great powers, the veto. Further conferences of the allies as at Dumbarton Oaks and San Francisco produced the United Nations Charter, which is still in the basic form of 1945. It has been slightly amended three times, once to enlarge the Security Council from 11 to its current 15, and twice to enlarge the Economic and Social Council from 18 to 27, and then again to its current 54. So it is not true that the uh, charter cannot be amended. It has historically been done so three times, however, on uh, very minor issues. This agreement did not usher in the world of peace that Secretary of State Cordell Hall promised but the event, the Moscow Conference of 1943, is very important for world federalists and all international reformers. It shows how their dreams may be actually accomplished. It will be done by diplomacy, given sufficient domestic opinion. To repeat, the dreams of world federation could be actually accomplished by diplomacy given sufficient domestic opinion. The alternative would be massive world revolution when all the forms of the UN system and international treaty law are thrown to the winds. Like the League of Nations, the UN Charter makes no provision for dissolution. It could simply be abandoned like the League, as the peoples of the world demanded a new form of world government. Now, as for the very short chapter six on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I wrote this in the rather awkward style as President Truman revealed the news to the press of a new type of bomb, an atomic bomb harnessing the basic power of the universe, which had already been used on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. The chapter is short, but the subject matter is explosive. The advent of the atomic bomb changed the history of relations between sovereign states. Immediately people sensed that as soon as other nations developed the bomb, a third world war would, could destroy all of civilization. The atomic bomb explains the rise of the World Federalist Movement. It was one crisis that moved people to rethink their situation on the planet. 
It was analogous to the multiple crises, the global problematique we face in our time. I assume that you are fully aware of the threat of nuclear war. What I invite you to do is to consider the multiple crises that now seem compar comparable for humanity to take action for solutions that might amount to something like world federal government. How will humanity respond to our crisis? I think I made a pretty good list of contemporary crises toward the end of my introduction. The threat of nuclear war or expansion of war to nuclear war, economic depression, ecological collapse, new pandemics, terrorism from the global south, and all the problems of the global problematique, problems beyond the powers of national states to solve alone. At the moment, it is only a crisis of the mind. Until there is another disaster on the scale of World War II, demonstrating the failure of the old ways of internationalism, we probably cannot expect revolutionary action. Small changes must continue to suffice. So with that, I see we have some new uh, attendees. I'd like to get their names and then I turn it over to you for uh, questions. Terrific. So are, are you asking for the newly joining people to introduce themselves when you say get their names or you're just writing down their names? I need to write down their names. Okay, fine. So I'll let you do that. And then I'll invite everybody to formulate your question um, while uh, Joseph is writing down the names. And you could uh, raise your hands in, uh, if you can raise your cyber hand, that, that's more helpful. If you don't know how to do that, if you just bring your cursor down to where all your options are, the chat rooms and all that stuff and hit reaction, click on that. And then once you click on reaction, raising your hand will be one of the uh, options that you have. So if you do that, that would be most helpful. And otherwise I will then call on people who have their flesh and blood hand raised. So Joseph, let me know when you're ready and I will start uh, calling on people. And let me remind you, when I do call on you, you'll need to unmute yourself if you're currently muted. I'd be happy to write down all the names and send them to Joseph in an email, if that would be helpful. Uh, Donna, I, I, I would like to know who, who has asked a question and I can respond to them by name. Thank you very oh, okay. much. I've got, I've got the names and so uh, please. Um, okay. Proceed. Ask, ask your questions. Terrific. So if Virginia, you would unmute yourself. We've got Virginia, Tad, and Bill in the queue. And I saw Simon uh, raised his flesh and blood hands. So we'll get him in as well. So Virginia, why don't you start us off? Hi, Joseph. Uh, I just wanted to ask if you could um, elaborate more uh, on General MacArthur's um, theological question uh, that you mentioned very briefly. And just say a little bit more about what what you think he meant by that, and what what you what you think is important for humanity right now. That's a theological question. All right. Yes, that's at the beginning of chapter six. Um, sorry, um, I'd like to get it right. Now, oh, phooey. Yes, here it is. 
Um, so at the beginning of chapter six, uh, there's a quotation from a general of the army, <clears throat> Douglas MacArthur, a person you would probably not uh, assume would have much uh, truck with uh, ideals of world peace and uh, world government. But um, when he received the Japanese surrender, he made a speech. And one of the things I did in preparing this book was to look in all sorts of unlikely places for uh, evidence. And I <clears throat> once um, on a trip to Washington DC, I decided to um, inspect the Pentagon. And uh, up there on the, in M MacArthur Hall, very prominently is this speech uh, printed. And you see that he, as he says, <clears throat> <clears throat> that um, military alliances, balances of power, leagues of nations, these are all standard solutions to the problem of peace, um, all in their turn failed, leaving the only path to be by the way of the crucible of war. The utter destructiveness of war as witnessed by Hiroshima and Nagasaki has now Blotted, now blots out this alternative. We have had our last chance. The problem basically is theological and involves a spiritual recrudescence and improvement of human character that will synchronize with our almost matchless advance in science, art, literature, and all material and cultural developments of the past 2000 years. It must be of the spirit if we are to save the flesh. Now, as I mentioned last time, um, when I realized that I was really doing theology, I had to slow down a little and, and think. And uh, Virginia, I really um, can't uh, too much uh, further uh, clarify what MacArthur meant by the problem being theological. <clears throat> Uh, but it is, it, it is so deep. It is not just a kind of mechanical uh, solution that we propose. As, as Albert Einstein used to say, the problem basically lies in the hearts of men. Uh, what, what the Federalists had to do, this is why I speak so often of changing public opinion. They had to somehow awaken in people their sense of, of common, uh, commonality with all persons uh, on earth. That's what's behind this uh, question about uh, representation. We had to be ready to accept one person, one vote as a principle. And, uh, and uh, this has proven to be very difficult. It used to be said that uh, world government was impossible without <clears throat> Oh, the formation of world community. And that's a fair critique. On the other hand, it's, <clears throat> you should bear in mind that if world community were perfectly formed, we wouldn't have been any need for world federal government. And in fact, the truth is that government helps to create community. It provides the security, the safety, the common rules, the economic uh, abundance that, that makes um, community possible. You can see it in the history of the United States. Um, when um, slowly the government of the United States um, began to um, form a more perfect union here among Americans and all the immigrants that came and, and settled and joined us. So I leave that as a um, profound problem uh, for you. It, it, and it's a good word to describe the difficulties uh, lying before you. Um, I sometimes say that, um, <clears throat> that um, we are at a stage of history when the sovereign state as the supreme authority 
is slowly giving way to humanity. Um, and that's a theological proposition. Um, stop. Okay, next question. Please. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Joseph. Okay, um, just let people know Ted's uh, next in the queue, followed by Bill, then Simon, then myself. Go ahead, Ted. Thank you, Mr. Executive Director. Hello, uh, Professor Barata. Um, my something's wrong with my camera, you guys. I'm sorry. I, I, I know you'd all like to see my, my big grinning face. Um, Professor Barata and, and colleagues, I, I hope you will indulge me to talk uh, for a bit, not just about this chapter, but about this work as a whole. And uh, if I may, to, to gush, to effuse about the importance of the work, the two volume work that the Professor Barata uh, has written. I, uh, some of you know the tale that I stumbled into this orbit uh, in 1990 when I was a graduate student at UCLA and a young think tank scholar in training uh, at the Rand Corporation. And I went to the Santa Monica Farmer's Market to get a bite. And there were Tom Camarella, Wendell Harder, and Ted Lutzinger sitting behind a table at the Farmer's Market for the World Federalist Association. And they had pamphlets and such, and they talked to me about this stuff. And I was like, why, why am I not learning this stuff as a, as a graduate student at UCLA? You know, studying U.S.-Soviet relations and the history of the Cold War. And I became fascinated by the concept, but also by the history. And I was just, to this day, I remain stunned. Einstein was talking about this stuff. Oscar Hammerstein, I'd done a little acting uh, as an undergraduate. I'd been in uh, Kiss Me Kate. Um, really, the president of the University of Chicago had a thing called the World the committee to frame a world constitutional convention. And I remain mystified to this day that even as a student of the Cold War era, none of this stuff was ever taught to me. Um, it, it is a hugely important historical fact that there was this movement, a genuine movement Ted, about the in idea of to, Ted, in fairness to all the people who are going to be asking questions, I ask you to please get to the point. Please be briefer. Thank you. Well, I'm trying to praise Professor Barata for this landmark work, that there, there is nothing like it, this right. two-volume work that really conveys this history. And I will, Bob. Um, it is my hope that someday we're going to create a movement and literally thousands of people will want to delve into this history as I have, and Joseph Brada's two volume work will be uh, the source that many of them want to dig into. And that does in fact now, Bob, lead to my question, which is why is this stuff not taught, Professor Barada? Why did I and all my colleagues, you know, who've studied international history of the international political history of the 20th century, why is the Fact, the undeniable fact that there was a major current of thought about creating a democratic world government. Why is that so wholly absent from the teaching of both politics, my field, uh, and your field, history? Well, Ted, that's thank a you very, very much. That's a very big question. I would like to say that uh, <clears throat> researching this book uh, proved to be an adventure. I. Um, uh, the more I looked, the more I found. And uh, I looked in places that uh, others advised me never to bother to look. And um, I became um, uh, convinced that history is stranger than fiction. Uh, this is a, a story so astonishing that no novelist with the greatest imagination could possibly have uh, ever dreamed this up. And moreover, everything in, it, in the book is absolutely true. And it's, there's a footnote. Uh, I regard the footnotes as um, proofs of uh, the truth of what I say. Um, um, now, um, I would like to say one more thing. Uh, it's a big book. Um, <clears throat> and I found that world federalism is actually difficult to think about. Most people give it about 10 seconds. It just couldn't happen. 
Uh, it's just unrealistic. There's not enough world community. Uh, a few people, uh, including I think most of you, you know, it just dawns on you and it just kind of overwhelms your heart. This is right. This is, this is what we need. And then, um, <clears throat> and then it seems that little progress is made. Well, I hope this book, for those of you who make an effort, will help you to think about world federal government. Uh, it is complicated. I'm sorry, it's a, it's a big solution to a big problem and it takes a big book to do it, to uh, convey this. But gradually, um, Tad, you, you're, you and I are pretty much in sync here. This is very serious uh, and uh, it's hard to think about it. What exactly are we going to do? So I'm, what I show is what some very courageous people did in the 40s to do about nuclear weapons. Uh, that problem is actually still with us, but there are other problems like global climate change um, and the, the loss of biodiversity, which um, are even uh, greater. So I hope it, it helps. Uh, the book will help. I wrote it, frankly, to, to be intelligible to, to uh, everybody. It's written in ordinary language. I think that book will be readable in a hundred years. Um, if any, if, and I tried to get a few copies into research libraries where it might actually last a hundred years. Thank you. Next question. Okay. okay. Thank you, Joseph. We have Bill, then Simon, followed by me and Carla May. Go ahead, Bill. You need to go off mute. Well, thank you and hello to everybody. And I'm sorry I missed uh, last month's first session of this. Uh, I have uh, uh, three issues I wanted to raise. Uh, one is mainly the question and one is just a, uh, an information thing. But uh, Joseph, I was wondering in terms of the definition of democracies in 1945 or between 1945 and 50, um, and the United Democracies Movement, what countries were straight in them considering would qualify? In particular, I'm wondering if you were a country that denied the women the right to vote, if you were a country that denied minorities the right to vote, if you were a country that was occupying uh, empire, uh, 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 colonies around the world. So, to me, would countries like uh, uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, Portugal, Netherlands, many, many countries uh, had um, were, were trying to reoccupy their empires and did so until those countries uh, resisted. So, who were the, how many democracies actually existed in 1945? Were there just a handful, or was a general feeling that there was 30 or 40 of the 51 original countries of the, of the United Nations. Um, the second question I wanted to raise was your view, did the Cold War, when the extreme anti-communism movement in the United States and the Cold War, was that the main political uh, movement that basically undermined the United World Federalist and the idea of a fundamental reform of the United Nations in the early years that people like Einstein and others were hoping for. Um, and then I'll just say that my last point was to raise, and I put it on the, on the chat room, that I hope people will take a look at this book called uh, The Internationalist, which was published a, a couple of years ago. It's called The Internationalist, uh, how a radical plan to outlaw war remade the world, which is a very controversial view of some very eminent uh, international legal scholars from Yale about uh, the importance of the impact of the UN Charter in terms of delegitimizing war on the basis of a 1928 treaty uh, that outlawed war. Thank you.
Uh, who is the principal author of uh, The Internationalists? Oops, I uh, guess. Uh, the authors are uh, Una Hathaway and Scott Shapiro. But I, I've put it in the chat down, down below. So if you go into the chat, you can see it. Um, well, these are questions that can be answered in a few words, but the words um, are full of meaning. Um, you know, um, the charter, uh, one way of answering, the charter um, is based upon a, a very minimal acceptance of certain norms. Norm is a word uh, not found in the charter. It comes from the Latin norma, which means rule. And the first rule, uh, it's interesting to do a, I, I have done this, um, <clears throat> to do a survey of the norms at work in the United Nations. And the first norm is, uh, the sovereignty of states. And this is reflected in Article 1.1 when it says that uh, the U UN United Nations is based upon the uh, sovereignty, the equal sovereignty of states. And the second norm is um, the uh, abolition of war. It's reflected in uh, Article 1.4. Uh, the purpose of the United Nations is to um, uh, bring, bring let me quote it exactly. Um, Save future generations from the scourge of war. <laughs> the Premier is a two four. Uh, all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. Uh, if states agree to renounce the threat as well as the use of force, wouldn't wouldn't we wouldn't wouldn't war have become obsolete and a stroke. And that's the second norm. And uh, that's in what you said, the, uh, the internationalists uh, found that the charter delegitimated war. It's actually delegitimated in an agreed norm uh, reflected in Article 2.4. And the, uh, the third norm is the ob observation of treaties. Uh, uh, Pacto sunt servanda. Um, and that's reflected in uh, actually in two, um, Article 2.2. Two. Um, all members in order to ensure the rights and benefits resulting from membership shall fulfill in good faith the obligations assumed by them in accordance with the present charter. And actually there's a, there are five articles in the charter in which uh, states pro profess to uh, adhere to the uh, processes of the uh, charter. Uh, Peaceful Settlement of Disputes, Chapter 6, as you know, Gale, and, um, and then uh, Action in Response to Acts of, ag of Aggression, Chapter 7. Now, um, as for the Cold War ha having undermined the World Federalist Movement, this is, I, uh, show abundantly, and you're absolutely right. Uh, the, short, the short answer to your question is yes, after the war, the, the uh, amity between the uh, allies broke up. Stalin was determined to uh, establish uh, friendly governments uh, on his Western border. This is still the issue today um, with uh, Ukraine. Um, and the uh, Western democracies just couldn't understand uh, why he would be so dictatorial about that. Um, you might know that there were two groups of polls, the London polls and the Lublin polls. And actually in 1945, um, the London polls went to Moscow thinking that they would be um, allowed to form a Polish government and, and Stalin just arrested them. <laughs> I'm telling you, you have to study a little Cold War history and. Uh, <clears throat> begin to understand this. Uh, so uh, the national leaders, Truman and Stalin, never lost control of events. The World Federalists uh, were very hopeful that they might form a massive movement of maybe 50 million people. And this was quickly snuffed out 
by um, fears of, of um, the enemy, the communists. Um, lastly, about democracies, qualified nations. Um, Bill, these were rough distinctions. And uh, what we meant by democracies in 1945 was just what Clarence Streit meant. Any country which had an elected legislature qualified. It didn't matter if they had laws like the United States of racial segregation, or if they uh, didn't allow women to vote, that was nothing. What mattered was that they had established a republic, however poorly uh, framed it was, and how, how long it was still going to take to make it a reality, but they had formed republics. Even Great Britain qualified as a democracy. Um, and really, it hasn't changed much um, uh, to this day. You know, I mean, is, it, is the United States of America really a kind of a model democracy? Um, I think we have to be a little cautious before we set ourselves up as a judges of other peoples. You know, is Russia just not our democracy? Well, you know, the Communist Party renounced its uh, leading role, and uh, there are actually four political parties in Russia, Putin's party is called United Russia, right? There's a communist party, yes, and there are two others, oddly enough, not a social democratic party. Okay, next question, please, thank you. Okay, um, thank you, and uh, turning to Simon. Thank you, Professor uh, Joseph Barata. Um, I think you touched upon it by quoting uh, Gerald Douglas MacArthur's quotation about spirituality. However, uh, also uh, Ted Daly touched upon it about education. And uh, don't you think these are two very important aspects of becoming successful in a world federation? For example, before I could drive my car, I couldn't just I had to be educated, I had to be trained, I had to be passing an exam, and I had to be licensed as a professional driver. How could I drive, drive a get car without that education, training, licensure? I couldn't have uh, successfully. Uh, don't you think this is lacking in the world? about getting together spiritually. Spirituality means, doesn't it mean loving one another unconditionally? Doesn't it mean forgiving one another unconditionally? Doesn't it mean getting rid of our anger within ourselves and towards each other unconditionally, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? And may, doesn't it mean equality between, between women and men, doesn't it mean equal rights or equal work, full employment, uh, free health care, free education, etc. Well, Simon, you are a maximalist. <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you something. Uh, I thought as you talked about the necessity for the rule of law, um, and then you moved um, to the subject of loving one another, I thought of um, a famous uh, statement by Mark Van Doren, which illuminates uh, federalism, really. Um, he said that um, the rule of law is what enables us to live peacefully with one another without having to love them. The rule of law is what enables us to live together peacefully without having to love one another. And that's, that's true. Uh, um, I mean, speaking of theology, um, this is one of the difficulties. It, we don't all have to become Christians, um, but um, a kind of minimal principle of our unity is uh, accepting the necessity for the rule of law. And um, I interpreted you to be uh, defending the, the, the idea of the rule of law. 
Um, as I mentioned last time, um, well, I, I, I can recommend books on the rule of law. Um, um, uh, last uh, month, I, I met, rec recommended a book coming out of Harvard, Harvard, um, uh, Our More Perfect Union, by Arthur N. Holcomb. Gee, there, uh, I've written bibliographies of, of, of this literature. Some of you uh, have noticed this. And um, there's a wonderful, there are wonderful uh, sources uh, for all these deep concerns that you have. I'd like to repeat uh, at, at the beginning of this uh, session, I uh, mentioned that I welcome uh, email uh, messages where you raise your questions for me and I can, I can sometimes help you quite specifically. I know the literature um, and it's a, it, it, it lies there neglected. Okay, um, Bob, are you next? Uh, me and then Carl and A, and then I'll call for another round of hands if there are any. Um, so yes, yeah, so my question is, <clears throat> excuse me, a few months ago, uh, I met with Richard Ponzio and uh, in our discussion, that was the first time I actually heard what you had said before, Joseph, about the three revisions to the UN Charter that have already occurred. I was not aware of that. But what he then went on to say, and I hope I'm not, not mischaracterizing him, but what I, what I thought I heard was he felt that would only take like three more um, you know, revisions to actually move us to a world federation. And he, he was saying that the conference that's coming up next year uh, that I think Gutierrez um, is initiating um, could be a major window uh, for pushing for, for UN structural change. So he, uh, the reason we were having this discussion is he was urging me to get CGS involved with that and really become kind of full partners in that and, and creating a campaign around that. So I wanted to um, ask your opinion on that. Um, is, is from what you know about um, what may be coming up next year and the kinds of opportunities that are there, um, what, um, if anything, can you say ab about that? Thank you. Well, uh, Richard Ponzio and the Stimson Institute um, are on the right track. Uh, I must say, I, I'm troubled. Um, nothing will happen without a state sponsor. Uh, uh, the uh, the uh, Secretary General's roadmap for uh, UN reform was addressed to the General Assembly. Uh, individuals like you and me who belong to non-governmental organizations do not have standing before the General Assembly. Even the Secretary General does not have standing. Uh, his only uh, function is under Article 98 to uh, coordinate and administer the state's members. So unless the state, it could be as little as Ecuador and its ambassador actually is one of the leaders of this um, 2023 movement. Um, I suspect it will be the middle rank powers, uh, particularly Germany and France, which um, might be the leaders. The big five are not gonna be the leaders. Uh, and they will do everything possible to frustrate in, uh, just this movement just the way they have every other time UN reform has been on the agenda. Uh, Germany actually has established a new um, grouping called the uh, Alliance for Multilateralism, now consisting of some 60 states. Um, and that could be, um, that could be influential. If, if Germany uh, or Canada or, if, uh, France uh, uh, took up this cause, they could uh, take uh, Ponzio's uh, um, principles, I even have a list of them here, and um, we might see some action. But all the most daring of the, of the principles for, uh, that the NGOs and the common people raised was to create a second chamber of the General Assembly representative of people. Uh, the, the, the very project of the 
democracy beyond borders. Um, but you see, this would be like uh, making the European Parliament elected, directly elected by the people in, as, as in 1979. And that, that would give democratic legitimacy, Bill Pace, that would be, give democratic legitimacy to the second chamber. And we would, even if the second chamber had no more powers than to deliberate, just like the first chamber, um, the fact that the people of the earth had participated in some way, no doubt through some weighted representation, um, there would be energy introduced into the United Nations. Uh, just as in the case of Hamilton and the, in the formation of the United States uh, Congress, energy was what was needed in the government. And that energy is, would, be, would be rooted in the attention and the will of the people. Well, the great powers, I, I frankly, look, I'm sorry, I'm, you know, I, I planned this, 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 my part today very carefully. I was gonna be so cool and calm. I, I don't think that will, I don't think anything will happen in 2023. It will be just like 2005. It'll just be another dead duck. What will happen? What will happen is such a crisis in the world that the United Nations is simply abandoned, like the League of Nations. And in this, uh, this, this upheaval, uh, there will be, there could be leadership and thinking. Uh, about a better, about a successor organization. And uh, the World Federalists and the Citizens for Global Solutions could be a part of it. I'm actually not sure just exactly what you should do. Um, it maybe you may not even have an opportunity to do anything. Um, if there's war in Ukraine, um, hey, another generation is gonna go by with nothing, nothing happening uh, at the United Nations. Um, and we'll be lucky to survive as an, as an independent democratic nation ourselves. Uh, uh, is there another question? Yes, we, we have another one in the queue. Let me just say, uh, Joseph, um, you don't have to worry about losing your cool because you're cool nevertheless. So let me just point that out. Uh, so moving on to column A, and you would need to unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Yes, I'm, what I'm going to add is probably just a further expansion of Tad's insights and building on the thought of others. But I want to go back to that MacArthur quote again and the question of the spirit. There's a lot of talk about going to the spirit, uh, and yet no one defines it. The the, the human spirit needs to be defined in terms of function. We know what physical function is. We know what emotional function is. But I would, I would like to hear you tell me what spiritual function is, because most of us would define it in terms of religion. They are not the same. Spirituality is a capacity of the human being to, for cognition, and free choice and decision. This is not found in any other species to the point in which it is found in a human being. Religions are coaches to train that function. And what history does is it reveals to us not only events and what has gone on, it also reveals to us what I'm going to call intellectual scotosis. Now, scotosis is a vis visibility term. It's a ocular term. It's a blind spot. It's a, a cataract. It is, it's usually used in, um, in ophthalmology, but I'm using it to speak about spiritual blindness, and it is deliberate. As Joseph has pointed out, one of our greatest Malays, and why he, I believe he speaks with the honest uh, pessimism of that coming meeting, is that we will again choose 
to be blind. We will choose not to see. We will choose to cover up the real truth that's standing right in front of our faces. And we will choose to be cataract. We will choose the shadow that overshadows what could be a creative new decision. This is, uh, this is the basis for what we are seeing government. We are seeing it in economics. We are seeing it in, uh, in, in what is going on with uh, ecology and with climate change. And if we don't start looking at this as a spiritual people, criticizing our own spiritual function, the way we are concerned about our mental health and our physical health with, with, a, with the omnium virus. If we don't begin to look at the choice of our blindness for entertaining the full data that lies before us, we are doomed because we are people with self-inflicted blindness. So I, I just wanna call that out. And I want to make the distinction between spirituality and religion. That's why it's a theological question. Um, well, um, thank you very much, Carla May. Um, is um, David Auden here? Yes, he's still here. Um, my. Um, I have to be a little careful here because my wife is uh, uh, often talks like you do, uh, and I have to. Um, I have my own somewhat different views. Um, I don't think she's even here anymore. Um, um, <clears throat> I, I am uh, here, Joseph. Oh, okay. Well, remember to keep your mute on. <laughs> <laughs> Carla May, um, I, uh, <clears throat> I've gone through my own struggles about religion and um, I, have, uh, I tend to understand the spirit as mind, uh, as in the French esprit. It means mind to my mind. And I kind of strict in what I uh, say about the spirit. Be um, you know, the, um, the United Nations uh, does not um, cite any religious teaching uh, in its charter. Uh, and it's, uh, they, in fact, the uh, expression of, of uh, uh, the use of religious uh, expressions at the United Nations is, is actually forbidden because it's so divisive. Uh, 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 and and the, um, what the, the, the UN was established not on the basis of some of the universal teachings of the prophets, uh, the great religious teachers, uh, it's founded on, as I mentioned, on the most minimal norms like of sovereignty of states, um, uh, 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 the renunciation of aggression and the, the keeping of treaties in, in, and of agreements between states is a very minimal organization. It's not a religious um, uh, movement, but you're quite right, I think, uh, to uh, point out that the problems are theological, as General MacArthur said, and uh, we have to find ways to um, see our fellow human beings as brothers and sisters. Um, I would like to say that if you study, <clears throat> there are historians who agree with you. And uh, I recently, H.G. Uh, Wells is one of them in his outline of history and, and uh, Arnold Toynbee is another in his study of history. Um, I would recommend really to you as you try to, find your, trying to, to try to uh, weave your mind around all these problems of our globe of our planet that you read some of these histories and uh, I recently reread um, 
The Outline of History by H.G. Wells. And he is absolutely eloquent about the role of religion in building a better world. And so is Arnold Toynbee. Um, I could, um, um, I think they're right. Uh, but things are moving very slowly and a, a, a disaster like another war uh, could set us way back. So um, I would recommend if you have, have the leisure and a little time, open up a, the outline of history. It's very dated. Uh, he, um, he uses terms that are like Aryan for the races of man, which are uh, now very obsolete. And he hasn't got a nice word to say about women, but that, that historian understood things in a broad way. And similarly, probably better, Arnold Toynbee did. Don't get just the abridgment by Somerville, get one of the volumes of the, where he's, that have not been abridged and all the t arguments for world government taken out. So more power to you, Carla May. <laughs> Please, is there anybody else who would yes, like to? Yes, we, we have several people. I'll point out we have a little less than 10 minutes to go. Um, speaking of norms, we have a norm of letting everyone speak first before anyone speaks second. Um, so I'm going to go to David Gallup next. Actually, we got the Davids up next. David Gallup and David Orton, followed by Virginia. So go ahead, David Gallup. Okay, thanks, Professor Brada. So um, what have you learned from your research of the history of the World Federation movement, playing the angel's advocate or being an optimist? Um, what can we do as an organization to advance World Federation and world citizenship? Well, I, I'm going to have to leave that to, to um, you and um, Bob Flax. Um, my sense is that uh, there's almost no world federalist movement amongst the people anymore. It's uh, you're a very small remnant, a saving remnant perhaps of, of, a, of a movement that had large conceptions and uh, left behind a, a large literature, but uh, has almost completely been forgotten. Um, I personally think that the changing the name to the Citizens for Global Solutions is a mistake. I think if you don't hold up a high ideal, uh, you'll be, you just can't be distinguished from global governance or the United Nations Association. But um, to hold up that ideal, of World Federation uh, is very difficult, actually. Uh, uh, what exactly are people going to do? Um, there needs to be more scholars and writers. We do need some new books, but there are some books on the, uh, just right around the, just this new book by Augusto Carlos, Lopez Carlos is typical. A tremendous book, uh, up to date, full of ideas, practical. You know, uh, he found my book and it inspired him. You know, it's not just Tad Daly who got inspired, it's uh, Augusto Lopez Carlos, you know. But a few more books is not going to do the trick. I, I think you aim to be political, I think you aim to, to, to change public opinion. And um, we have a kind of record, uh, and we haven't. We have failed. We the problem is so enormous. It's not for lack of trying. Uh, this it seems to me that that the states, the sovereign state system, is under is is suffering uh, a collapse. All right. Now, what will replace it? It, in principle, it could be a more perfect union of humanity. 
And this is what I work for and what I think you work for. But the historical uh, prediction would be a general collapse of civilization. I've recently read a book on that by Watson. If you're not a pessimist, you, sh you should read this book. Headed into the abyss. It's about the collapse of civilization as early as 2070. And um, honestly, how can we, uh, how can we, how can we possibly move people in sufficient numbers to, to aim higher at, at United Nations reform? I, I'm at a loss. I wrote a, I wrote, I, this book is my effort, okay? It took a lifetime. So more power to you. Who's got another question? Okay. We have uh, David Ort next in the queue, followed by Virginia. If you wanna raise your hand, please go to the, uh, where you can raise your cyber hand and uh, we will do that. Two quick comments, uh, Joseph, based on your two chapters for today. Uh, concerning the uh, notion of a, a spiritual problem that MacArthur mentioned, I think the Baha'is have realized that. They have taught that you can create a world government, you can set it all up, but it's not going to work and it's not going to last unless it's based on the idea of a spiritual principle, the human family, that all of us are brothers and sisters and we're all in this together. Second comment is I've been fortunate, uh, if that's the proper word, to visit two places on our earth that I think every uh, person who has any kind of power in any government must, uh, must visit. That is Hiroshima. I've had the honor of visiting that and studying there. And secondly, Auschwitz. I think everybody has to visit that place. Um, those two places uh, and maybe some others uh, must be requirements for those who have any kind of power in any kind of national government. Well, thank you, David. I've not been to Hiroshima. I've not been to Auschwitz. However, I've been to Stalingrad and I've been to the reconstruction of the Treblinka uh, death camp uh, in Israel. Uh, I lived in Israel for a year. I converted to Judaism. Um, and uh, I must say, um, what, the, the uh, uh, Israeli government um, <clears throat> rebuilt Treblinka because the, the Germans burnt it down before the Russians got there. But uh, they rebuilt it. And uh, there's a and the school children by law are required to visit Treblinka. And I was um, a young Jew convert, and uh, I made it my business to get there with my wife. And what really moved me were the. Um, Nobody can relate to 6 million Jews killed in the Holocaust. What moved me were the little towns that were identified and the actual number of Jews in those, each town that were killed. And you can relate to eight innocent people killed or 15. I don't know how much suffering do we have to witness to get smart. I, I, I'm, I'm, I just, I, you know, in my case, I have to tell you, well, I was a Marine and um, we were trained to kill. Uh, and I reached a point where I 
just couldn't deal with all the evils in the world. It was crippling to my spirit. I get angry and I get inarticulate. I'm so angry. So I have deliberately tried to light the candle in the darkness, okay? I have tried to deal with a positive vision of peace as it could be produced practically by the establishment of a federal government of the world. You may think that's a little foolish, but it's a, there's so many people tearing down the old order that I just let them go. You know, all I've tried to do is, is, is try to put up a little positive story. All right. Who's, who's got another question, please? Okay. Uh, Joseph, I just want to check in with you. Uh, last month, there were so many questions that we ended up going over for a few minutes, uh, about 10 minutes or so. Um, I just wanted to check in with you. It looks like we, we also have an, enough questions to go past our quitting time. Um, so I want to check to see if, 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 that, would, if, if that would work for you. Um, or not, because we could certainly end on time. Or, of course, yes. Okay, great. All right, I did, I did see in the chat there were one or two folks who didn't even have a hand-raising function. So let me get Virginia and Bharat in, and then we've got Gail. Um, and then I want to see if there's anyone else who hasn't gone yet first before we take the people who want to ask again. So go ahead, Virginia. Thank you very much. I want to raise the question that Carla May so ad articulately raised uh, as a foundation of my work and as partner to Joseph and world communities. <laughs> Joseph, uh, one of his favorite historians is Arnold Toneby. And in his, in his study of 21 civilizations and 12 volumes of the study of history, Toneby developed a model of tracing the birth, growth and decay of each of the civilizations. Throughout, he held that authentic religion and spirituality gives civilization its vitality. When religious and spiritual groups decay, Toynbee feared the, re the uh, civilization fails. Toynbee feared the West was perishing after the tragedies of the two world wars. The United Nations was our hope, but it was conceived in member state interests 75 years ago, the death knell of a world needing co cooperation. There have been nearly 300 wars since its founding. A new approach is needed to reform the UN. I do believe, like Bill, that it's possible as we grow, we, do, we develop the spiritual muscle that must accompany our practical views. And I've had, I've written two books on this. Uh, and I wanna just point out Doug Harmerschel's work. Doug Harmerschel is known as the spiritual secretary general. And what he says, we all have a center of stillness surrounded by silence. And without that piece of reflection that I build into reconciliation leadership, my signature program and my life work, we cannot embody the, the skills and competencies we need to make to reform the United Nations. I'll also draw on the work of Thomas Bianca, the Hopi elder who spoke in the General Assembly in, in 1992. And he spoke of the need for a new way to uh, address humanity's uh, evolution, very much like General MacArthur. So there's a context for spirituality in the UN system. And I wanted to inform everyone that everyone has that center of stillness surrounded by silence. We call it leadership from the inside out in our programs. Joseph, do you wanna comment on world community can be formed from that? We have a Center for Global Community and World Law that has been in ECOSOC um, uh, accreditation at the UN. Joseph's work on global government with mine and world community without, we have to do this together. It can't be done separately. Um, well, um... I noticed that the whole conversation has, has been about religion or, or spirituality. 
um, and, and not about the practical politics of World Federation. Um, I don't think it will help Citizens for Global Solutions to take up as kind of a spiritual witness. I, I just, you should leave that to um, those who are already doing it. Um, what interested me about the World Federalist Movement was that it was a practical politics. And I get into trouble with people who think it's just utopianism. I don't think it's utopian. To me, it's just that's, a not, minimal, that's not what I'm saying. It's not it's utopian, just, Joseph. It's the minimum. A federal union of humanity is the minimal change in order to um, establish peace. <clears throat> the, as I said at the in, in the introduction, I, I think the Baha'is are, are uh, make a good distinction of uh, the, the establishment of a world federal government would only only establish the lesser peace, but it would create the conditions, the economic and, and material conditions for the perfection of religion or what they call the most great peace, okay? I'm dealing with the lesser peace. I'm dealing with practical politics here um, and, and things think, like and things like bringing, I, I, in, bringing in democracies which are less perfect uh, than others is just part of the practical politics of doing that. I think we, we did it when we founded the United States of America and other countries which have established federal unions have done it too. There have been some 30 historic uh, uh, federations. Those are our models. And I leave the spirits, the spiritual perfection of humanity, I have to leave to others, okay? I, and, and Virginia, including you, Virginia. I, I'm just not doing that. I'm. Um, can I have another question, please? Sure, Barat, we have, we have, have Barat and then Gail in the queue. Go ahead, oh, Barat. Barat. Barat, you're on mute. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Barado. Uh, you know, I'm reminded of the time when. I was a young student in India and I learned about the great books program. Uh, and that kind of introduced me to a much wider uh, worldview and civilizations beyond my own. And I, while all, among all my surroundings, Hinduism and Islam and those things were moving along just learned about the independence of India and the uh, rapture uh, between of breakup of India to India and Pakistan and how religion played a big role. It was kind of uh, very nice for me to be able to expose to great books and I wanted to be a scientist and go west. Anyway, I'm here <laughs> up west. And now I think about this session and I'm really quite impressed by your depth and your uh, knowledge, uh, experience and wisdom. But at the same time, I'm somewhat perturbed by the pessimism that comes in here. I sometimes think that maybe, you know, we shouldn't really be doing anything at all because no matter what we did, it's not going to make that much difference in the short time that we're going to live. So I want to change that. Uh, and my question is, you could provide a real, real gift to us and other people that come along. If you can create your own list of great books, I would love to see, you know, you, you keep talking about this book, that book, and I don't know about them. You know, please send us a kind of a list of what you consider somebody starting, a man from outer space knows nothing about the earth and human affairs and wants to, in a short period of few months or a year, understand it. I would love to see Professor Barata's list 
of knowledge of the world. Thank you. If you can do that, <laughs> if you will do that. Right. I, I've already done it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's a, I have a, even in this book, I have an annotated bibliography and it starts with the classics. Um, uh, going all the way back to Dante, um, Henry the Fourth, and Kang Yu Wei in China, and so on. Um, and I, I, I could tell you that uh, I am myself a beneficiary of a, of a great books education because I went to St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland, and I read great books for four years. I have a bookcase downstairs of great books. These are the universal great books, but I do have what you're asking for, a kind of um, a list of great books of world federalism. It's right behind me here. Um, and I have a list of that. I could send it to you. If you send me a, your email address, I'll send you the list. Uh, it's quite impressive. Yeah. These are not just all the books that have been written about this subject. These are the greatest books. The ones that Joseph, we could send that. We could send that to the whole book club if you want to send it to a uh, Gail. All right, I'll I'll do that. Yeah. I, Thank I you would, very much. Uh, I would like to. Um, you, you you folks could actually help me a little. Uh, because I have things that I would like to uh, find good homes for, since I'm probably going to kick the bucket one of these days. Um, I I made up uh, a short document called the, the theses of this book, my book, you know, and a second short document called its achievements. And I would like to share this with the group, because if you can't get through the whole book, uh, I don't think anybody is going to do that, even uh, David, um, even David uh, uh, Gallup. Um, still, um, it might help you to uh, quickly um, internalize what this, what the theses and the achievements of the book. I'd like to see that. I'll do that too. Great. Um, we're, we're happy to forward anything on that, that you want to. And we're also going to have on our new website, we are revising right now, a document section there. Uh, so any documents that you want put online, uh, we can post that as well. Bharat, before... I would like to add of something for you, please, because you asked last time a very good question: uh, why, why uh, don't other scholars take up this cause, and why is this not known widely, even um, uh, outside of, say, the United States or Britain or Canada? Um, there was an attempt to do just what you're asking uh, in the '50s, after the Korean War and the end of the World Federalist Movement. Um, Robert and Hutchins of the University of Chicago had been um, uh, had uh, become a, a director of the Ford Foundation and Grenville Clark made a proposal to him to establish about a, a dozen uh, centers for the study of world law around the world in the principal civilizations of the world, one of them being India, another Japan. Um, and um, they estimated, Hutchins and Clark estimated that they would need about $25 million to start the, the dozen uh, centers for the study of world law. And uh, it came to the attention of the Secretary of State at the time, uh, um, John Foster Dulles, who let the board of the Ford Foundation know that Clark's proposal was contrary to the policy of the United States. <laughs> and as a result, Clark was not funded. Uh, but a remnant of this project survived in um, the institution known as the uh, Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions, which under Hutchins' leadership got established in Santa Barbara, California. Uh, until, uh, oh, I forget how long, about uh, 20 years ago, until the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions was doing just what you want but it was only based in one country. And the, 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 so the, the project of universalizing this, this uh, study 
uh, still lies before us. Thank you, Bharat. And could I have another question here, please? Yes, we have Gail, and then I'll see if there's anyone else who wants to ask questions for the first time. And if there aren't, I'll get to the people who want to ask for the second time. So Gail, go ahead. Well, you made reference to an equity tribunal in chapter four, and I'm curious about that. Uh, with this situation in Ukraine, you know, I, it just struck me how, again, we're close to a po possibly nuclear war. And the people in my uh, peace and justice circles know, I think, practically nothing about uh, US so-called adversaries. I think if we're gonna have a, um, you know, you were saying that it takes, um, you know, people need to know that it ne there needs to be popular support for peace. And at present, the way things are structured, Americans hear the American foreign policy line about what's happening in Ukraine. Russians hear their line about what's happening and they don't hear each other's. And yet the first principle, it seems to me, of resolving a, a conflict is to get the other side. And the peace and justice community hasn't gone to even that step one, which frustrates me. So I'm wondering whether this equity tribunal would um, help to address that or what it's about? Well, Gail, your question would be music to the ears of any lawyer. Um, equity is distinct from law. You'll sometimes uh, hear of, um, of uh, uh, projects of law and equity. And you could ask, well, what's the difference between equity and law? Well, <clears throat> Um, equity, law means uh, statute law or customary law. And it's usually written down in books and, uh, law and judges uh, can cite it. Uh, and uh, in England, why um, the, uh, <clears throat> the rule of law was very greatly developed, but there were, um, I forget now, I used to know um, uh, back in the, um, late middle ages why um, there were lawyers who were so clever they could use the law to frustrate justice. And so uh, the king established a, a court of equity uh, in which the judges applied not the law, statute and custom uh, oh, uh, or, uh, or uh, the common law, but rather equity. And equity was the judge's judgment apart from the law of where justice lay. So uh, a court of equity, uh, Clark and Sohn uh, proposed that uh, in addition to the International Court of Justice, there ought to be a court of equity, which could deal with political questions. The ICJ deals only with legal questions and they're very narrowly defined. And everything else is political, which means it can't be dealt with by, by the law. Well, Equity, a court of equity is just what we need for a crisis like the one in Ukraine. I would like to say something else and which you touched on too. You said, what we need is to be able to hear the other side. And Vladimir Putin, I can tell you, has written the most powerful historical account of Ukraine's relation to Russia. It's available uh, on the web. If you just Google um, Putin, Ukraine part of Russia, it'll come up. It's a long historical study of, the, of how Ukraine's relationship to Russia. It's, and Putin um, argues with great historical force um, that Ukraine basically is part of Russia and it means frontier in Russian. Um, and it's been part of Russia since the, uh, uh, since the, um, the, the, uh, the, the state of Rus in Kiev. Now, <clears throat> there's, a, uh, there's a principle here in international relations which good historians observe. It's, it's the, are you still listening? It's the principle in Latin, aude partem alteram, listen to the other side. 
I recommend that you that you you pick up Putin's account of Ukraine's relation to Russia, and and read it down, because that's the why the American policymakers don't seem to know the history of Ukraine's Russia. It's like in the at the time of the Vietnam War, we didn't know what Vietnam's relation was to China, and we just assumed that the Chinese were trying to take over Vietnam and um, establish a dictatorship. We didn't know that Vietnam had a long history of resistance to China. And similarly here, we're about to go get, to let ourselves get entrapped in a war in, U in Ukraine, which is just not our business. And we, um, so follow that rule. I followed it too. I, I claim to be a, 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 a a master practitioner of the principle of aude partem alterum, always read the other side, know your opposition. Okay, another please. Okay, let me first see, is there anyone else who hasn't asked the question that would like to? I see Byron and then Anna. Thank you, Joseph, for everything you're doing and saying today um, in your book and in your chapter four you expose for us the fact that the state department was was considering notions of world federalism uh in that early period in the 41 and two and three and i think it is the case that you were the person who has brought this forward no one else has i've never heard of it before and i've been in this field a long time so uh, we need to acknowledge you for, for that and want to know if, if it is the case that you were really the first person to cover that in a, in a history. Well, as far as I know, I, I, I am, uh, I don't know what moved me to, to go searching in the, in the records of the State Department in the early 40s, um, I think I saw a reference to this in some work. Um, and then uh, if you get to the National Archives and uh, you can request the Harley Nodder papers. This is what I did. I have no idea what was in them, except that for, there was some reference to world federalism in the Harley Nodder papers. So I thought, well, whatever the Harley Nodder papers are, I ought to go look. <laughs> so I did. The same trip that took me to the Pentagon. <laughs> oh man! And, and you know what? Once you once you start once you start bucking the system and uh, doing the things that people advise you never to do, and looking reading the opposition, you know, uh, you find things. You find very very powerful things. It's just, it's just lingering there in the archives. It's a follow-up question. Uh, what do you? What would that have been due to? Would it been because Emory Reeves hadn't written his book yet? There was Clarence Street. It was right. Federalists yeah. in England, right? Or that is that the influence that was on that I, brought this question I, up? In the chapter, I think, in the chapter four that I, 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 I cite the. Uh, literature that was in the possession of the State Department at the time, and Clarence Wright's books are, right. is one of them. And it, so it's principally his influence, would you, would you say, that brought that forward? Yes, I think, I think uh, Streit, um, you see, uh, Clarence Streit, uh, his book Union Now in 1939, was uh, very, um, very prominent. It, it promised, it promised, uh, to avoid this, uh, a great war with Nazi Germany. It, it argued that the democracies had the military power to overawe the Germans. Uh, if they would only unite and combine their forces, they would have a preponderance of force that would uh, that even Adolf Hitler would have to respect. And so uh, Streit's ideas uh, became uh, quite widely known. And that book was a bestseller. Uh, the State Department uh, had that influence um, available to them, and the Harley Nodder papers describe um, that in principle there were two choices, um, as I just described, and um, 
uh, even though federalism was rejected because they thought that the, the peoples of the earth were not ready, uh, probably that was correct. Uh, still, um, it was the a fundamental alternative before the, 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 the special committee in the State Department. Uh, thank you. And I would just add that it's in a way that's sort of the CGS's purpose or one of its purposes is to uphold the standard of World Federation, which people will not may not want to go there, but at least they know it exists and it will be something they can use to frame the discussion as it was even then in the early 40s. Well, you can't uphold the ideal unless you will enunciate it. Yeah, that being our job to to get that in, into the conversation, even if we don't think it'll work out in our favor, at least we have this in the discussion ongoing. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, I, I see that that's why I get optimistic about our work, to be honest. But thank you, Joseph, for answering my questions. Okay, then we'll move on to Anna. You're still on mute, Anna. Hi, I'm Anna. Um, I want to apologize. I, won't, I don't want to ask a question. I just wanted to thank you for having me here today and for this very inspiring discussion. And I hope to be able to, to be allowed to join another time again. Anna. Thank where, you. Where are you? I'm in the UK. Ukraine. UK. Have you seen uh, Vladimir Putin's um, study of Ukrainian history with- it's No, called, England, uh, England. England. In the UK, England. Oh, UK. Oh, I see, okay. United Kingdom. Yeah, I never can make myself say that. United Kingdom. I, I studied, I, I teach a English history. Um, I always say Great Britain. Um, United Kingdom, it just doesn't. <laughs> Got it. Okay, Isn't thank you. Enough? Okay, anybody else who's has not asked the question yet before we go to the second time around? Okay, seeing none, Carla May, you're on. Just a very quick comment, um, uh, Joseph, to, you, um, to your own deep recognition of the both and in that Latin statement. You and Virginia are each a hand. You cannot clap with one hand. You cannot think properly with one lobe of the brain until the brain is forced to take on the functions of the other part of the brain in surgery. So all I'm saying here is that with your points of view, it is, in, it, it is absolutely uh, just very important that it's a both and in this effort that one perspective is not sufficient. I want to thank you so much for this wonderful, enlightening discussion. Um, thank you, Carla May. Um, 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 you know, um, I've tried to write a book about practical politics um, and um, it has a spiritual foundation. It's true, and I. But um, I hope that you that you all will go to the do make the effort to understand what could practically be done. Um, use my book as a guide uh, to what other people thought could practically be done. Uh, this is not something just in the realm of. Um, of what I call, what I might call prophecy. Um, this is a, a just a, a, it's written in the spirit of the, the Federalist Papers of Hamilton, Madison, and Jay. Uh, it uses the experience of the United States 
uh, to uh, help guide us into the experience of other peoples. And they have established their states like India uh, or, or, or Germany, you know, or Russia. Um, I leave these, I leave the prophecy to, uh, to others, um, including my wife. Um, but to keep, keep your, uh, do not lose sight of the practical politics of uniting humanity. That's the problem. Okay, please, another. Okay, um, we've got me and Ted in the queue, then I'm gonna wrap up. Um, it's almost a, going on a half hour overtime. Um, I've got another meeting, we've got other things going on, I've got to use this Zoom account. Um, so, um, so anyway, so, so yes, yeah, so I, I was going to say that as, as you spoke, um, Joseph, in response to the last uh, couple of questions, there were um, a number of things that what you said reminded me of, and I, I just wanted to throw, throw these things out. Um, one, if everything, well, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Naomi Klein and her uh, book, The Shock Doctrine. Um, she makes the point that, um, that there are these ideas that are sitting around and sometimes for a very long time. And when you have a major cataclysm often that, that sets a culture into shock, sometimes there's a window for these ideas to be brought forward. And she mentions 9-11 and the Patriot Act as one of the recent big examples that, that the, you know, the project for American dominance, the new American century, all of this kind of stuff was just sitting around there. And then we had 9-11 and they were able to rush legislation through in the middle of that shock. So one of the things, even though CGS is not hoping for this, um, one of the possibilities is there will be some major global cataclysm and we, and, and then everyone will, will jump in with their things and what we should do. And we want to, one of the things we want to do is make sure our voice is in there and these ideas are in there. So part of what we're doing, it's not our mainstay, but to prepare um, to be, to, to have that exposure at the time if people are groping for stuff when the next um, pandemic kills a quarter of the world's population or a nuclear war or an environmental cataclysm or whatever. So that's just a side issue, but with the, um, even, if you have, if, even if you have a negative scenario when you're doing scenario planning, uh, you could plan for the negative scenario. So that's one of the things where we've been thinking about. The second thing I wanna say is um, in response to, I, I, I don't remember the Latin that you said, but the listening to the other, um, that w when I was uh, studying conflict resolution, um, they used the example of a diplomat. I don't recall the fellow's name. It was a diplomat at the UN. I don't know if he was American, um, but I don't think he was. But his, his principle was, was twofold. First, you had to listen to the other, but then you had to repeat back what you heard to the degree that the other says, yes, you got it right, even if you don't agree. So they say, blah, blah, blah. And then you respond back, oh, I think you said blah, blah, blah. And they said, well, you know, two thirds of that was correct, but you missed this part. And then you say it and they, so, so this diplomat was suggesting that negotiations are not to be allowed to proceed until that happens. That you don't have a negotiation until each side can fully hear the other and feed it back, whether they agree with it or not. And, and this diplomat was suggesting that that would resolve like 80% of the world's problems if you can just do that. The last thing I wanna say is to uh, quote Chris Hedges, a um, former New York Times war correspondent who's kind of a leading progressive uh, thinker and writer, uh, one of the more depressing ones, but nevertheless, <laughs> he's, uh, he's out there. And, uh, and he often says that I don't do what I do because I think it will work. I do what I do because it's right. And I, I, I think for me, that, that's what drives, wh whether or not this is successful is, is one thing, I hope it is. But I don't know anything else to do that's righter and better 
to respond to the world's problems. So I often lean on Chris Hedges uh, for that quote. Uh, thank you. I'll turn to uh, Ted. Sabrata, uh, thank you so much for just a terrific two hours of just intellectual substance and history and depth and even emotion and passion. You're, the, the emotion and passion you showed uh, moved me uh, a great deal and I'm sure uh, others as well. And Bob, Byron, um, I, 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 I'm sorry to sort of close with a bit of a downer comment, but there's something that I'm just having been here for this two hours that I'm just so disappointed about, which is zero, zero of the young world federalists are here. I mean, in theory, there's dozens, maybe even hundreds of young 20 somethings who claim to be enthused about the idea of world federation. And here they've had an opportunity to engage with this great mind, this great thinker on the history and substance of this idea and zero of them have shown up. And I, I hope we can fix that somehow. So we're doing something wrong with them. You know, if, if, if zero of them have shown up to avail themselves of this terrific opportunity to engage directly with the great mind, the great world government mind of Joseph Parada. I hope we can maybe get them to watch this video and in the future to show up to, to undertake that direct engagement. Okay. And thanks, thanks much, Professor Parada, for your inspiration. I'll just after jump, many years in the past. I'll, I'll just jump in before Joseph responds, um, which in my experience with working with the younger folks is they're very enthused about World Federation. They're not as enthused about books. So that, that's one of the issues that we're having to deal with. And we'll do that by generating videos and other means because they're just not as thrilled about books. Okay, thank you. Joseph, did you want to jump in? Well, uh, I've often mentioned um, Augusto Car Carlos Lopez. Uh, he's uh, actually invited me to, to a, do a podcast in the next few weeks. <clears throat> and one of his questions was, um, what could you say to young people who are so discouraged about the future today? Tell me something that would, uh, that would uh, engage and give hope to young people. I've actually composed a little answer to that question. I have it already. <laughs> I tell you what, I'll, I'll send you the podcast reference and maybe somebody who doesn't like to read books uh, actually listens to podcasts, which I cannot understand, but uh, uh, let me, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I have actually got an answer to that question. Something to inspire young people. Yeah. <laughs> Terrific, thank you. Um, I was, I did say we would wrap up, but I see one hand up who has not yet spoken before. So I want to give Lynn the floor because she has not yet spoken. And Lynn, if you could please be brief and then we'll say a few words just to close up. Uh, go ahead, Lynn. Thanks for bringing up Naomi Klein and disaster capitalism. And also thanks for, um, bringing up something that uh, this this quote memorizes it um that's george bernard shaw said the wor the single worst problem with communication is the illusion that it has taken place and um i also wanted to bring up joseph's concern about the six million that is just unfathomable to consider and how a small number in a village here and there brings it up. And, and I think the biggest number is one. That's the biggest number. Thank you. Joseph, anything you want to say to either respond or wrap up the whole session for yourself? Well, <clears throat> justice starts with one. Um, however, um, uh, in order to deal with this problem of uh, the anarchy of states and the, common, <clears throat> the, the commonality of war, I have uh, studied international relations and 
um, and uh, history. And I have become kind of, um, I mean, I have to deal with things like 60 million dead in World War II, you know, or the, the, the count of the dead in war since 1945, I once reckoned it out, it's about 24 million. And, and people, <clears throat> and there are people who say, well, 24 million compared to a population of 7 billion is trivial. We can get along fine just losing 24 million people. A war is not going to end. It's just too, not that serious. It's uh, actually, it's declining in lethality. And um, so I confess, uh, Lynn, my, my mind is uh, so overwhelmed with the magnitude of the injustices of our world that um, I go ahead and talk like this. Uh, you have to, you, you, you teach students, you have to tell them, <clears throat> you, uh, you have to describe international relations. And, you know, um, you know the death toll for American invasion of Iraq after 2003? It's kind of important to know this number. We went in there to change the regime of Saddam Hussein, didn't we? But to get that one man, we had to kill 140,000 Iraqis. Now, how can the, we have to have, a, have minds that can deal with this kind of reality. This is the magnitude of the problem. Okay, enough. I'm worn out. Well, thank anybody you. So, yeah, is there thank you so else? much. Joe. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Joseph. Is there anybody else? Okay, I'll, I'll let Simon get in. Then, well, let me first let me first double check. I did promise a time for announcements at the end if people had events or things to announce. Please raise your hand because I want to see if there are any of those. Okay, Simon, you'll have the last question, then Gail and I need to wrap up a few housekeeping matters, and then we'll officially close. So Simon, go ahead. I love, I love all of you, and uh, particularly Joseph, uh, uh, for all these wonderful ideas. One idea we did not mention that has worked is the European Union. That's the only idea that has brought countries together since 1949. And we ought to see how we could expand that to a world union from the European Union, EU to WU. And I've written about that, discussed that several times, but we need the cooperation you know, of the European Union to see how it could be expanded to the rest of the world as they did so successfully. Unfortunately, the rest of the world not being prepared, you know, they began to hurt the European Union and making it, uh, you know, disturbing it back to the old days, old ways, unfortunately, because the rest of the world wasn't prepared. Joseph, I'll let you have the last word. <laughs> well, he's right. The European Union is a success. Uh, European Union is the uh, <clears throat> practical result of the dreams of World Federation after World War II. Um, you should read the um, Jean Monnet left memoirs, which are very instructive for world federalists. I'm afraid that I'm, the young people will be disappointed because I'm suggesting another book. Um, honestly, uh, that drives me crazy. Uh, young people who don't read books, I really uh, ignore, I let them go. Uh, those, these are not the people that will make a, 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 a new world. Um, but you really should uh, study the European Union. It's, it's another topic on uh, Augusto Carlos Lopez's list for me. I've written about that too. Okay, I have to say goodbye. Thank you very much. I, Thank you. Next time, I must beg of you, read the chapters rather closely. Quiz me about the history. Um, uh, 
I cannot solve all the spiritual problems. <laughs> but there actually is the practical politics is, is very interesting. If you will just concentrate on it, it does mean reading a book. It's true, I know. But um, it there is light there. There is. There is light there. Okay, bye. Thank you so much, Joseph. We'll let you go. I just want to take a moment to remind people that if they have not renewed their membership for the new year uh, for Citizens for Global Solutions, please go to the website and do so. We're trying to build a stronger organization now. We've hired a few people. Um, we need to pay salaries. We need to actually uh, build a website and fund it. And we need to print brochures and booklets and videos and all that to get the word out. Um, so we do need everyone's support. So with that, Gail, is there any business on your end that we need to, to wrap up? Just remind people that the next session, the third session in a series of six on this book will be the second Saturday of March. That's March 12, noon to 1.30 Eastern time as usual. And we will be focusing on chapters eight and 16. Eight um, is called the Dublin Conference, Grenville Clark, UN Reform, and 16 is the Crusade in the World. I'll send info um, in an email, but get it on your calendars in the meantime. Thank you all so much for coming. This was an incredible conversation. We'll see you next month. And Gail, if you could hang out a bit, we'll uh, do our debriefing. Okay. Take care, everybody.